That's why we're here. That's why we're here to, to meet. Pastor, uh, a few weeks ago or last week, whatever it was, uh, approached a subject and it's been stirring on my heart. It's like something that's been working on me for some time. And uh, let's back up a second. How much should we trust in our experience? Not, okay? Our experience doesn't mean anything except our experience. Sometimes if we go back to the Word of God and we take experience and we say, hey, this, this is, there is some truth to this, and we can use our experience to help other people. Um, let me just take an example. Ryan, I don't think much of you picking on him, but he grew up Catholic. Is that true? So here, here's a guy who grew up Catholic. If he talks and he, he witnesses to a guy that is Catholic, um, he's probably going to be able to relate with them much easier than a guy that did not grow up as Catholic and understand their difficulties and getting over certain hurdles. You can use your experience to help you get somebody past a hurdle. And uh, doesn't mean that I can't witness to a Catholic person. It just means that he has some experience to say, hey, hey, I've been down this, this road, and here's how I can help you. And I, he, he would understand the Bible verses to, to back that up. Um, so one of the experiences that I have is being a missionary. Sorry about the throat lozenge and chewing this thing up and getting rid of it. But, um, otherwise, I'm going to gag up here. But um, one of the experiences I have is that coming from a, a missions background a little bit, I've I've been to a third world country. I've been there. I've been, been through the deputation trail. I've been through some of those things. And most of you have not. So I want to back up and we want to talk about missions today and what is your responsibility and then what is the church's responsibility. And we want to look at Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 13, and uh, verses 1 through 3. I don't know why I keep saying chapter 3. I, I told Jaden the same thing. Um, Acts chapter 13. And now there was in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manen, I'm not sure how to say the name, but we'll, we'll go with that, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when he had fast, and when they had fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Um, let's pray, Father. <coughs> Lord, as we look into your Word here and what is our responsibility as missions. And uh, what is the church's responsibility? Help, help us to maybe look at some things in a new light <coughs> and uh, be able to, to uh, encourage one another and yet get us all onto the same track and the same page. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So the first thing we need to do is define our responsibility. Now, I've heard many missions conferences and we bring up um, certain verses, but I want to ask some questions about the church. Now, if I pick on your tradition, be careful. You know that traditions are not doctrine. We understand that, right? So we can have a tradition, even in a church, it is not a doctrine. We have a tradition of having a potluck every, every Sunday night. Is that a doctrine from the Bible? No. no, it's our tradition, okay? It's what we do. And uh, there's things that are done sometimes in Baptist churches that we say, those are doctrines. That's the way it's done. And you go, I can't back that up with Scripture. And you go, wow, that's painful. So if I pick on your tradition, I want you to take it just like that throat lozenge. I want you to suck it and take care of it. And then, you know, it'll, it'll eventually go away. But I want you to see if some things are true. Don't just say, that tastes bad. I'm going to reject it and get it out of here. But we take doctrines from the Pauline epistles. Those are the epistles written by Paul. So, I want you to look at Matthew chapter 28. Now I'm going to go, oh man, everybody.
everybody's going, what, what is he doing? Hold on tight. Matthew chapter 28. I want to ask some questions. When we study the Bible, we ask questions. Who, why, what, when, where, right? Okay. Verse 16 of Matthew 28. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them. Who's the them? Those eleven disciples. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Who was that commandment given to? Regularly we hear that's given to the church. I think there's a principle there, but this command was given to these 11 disciples. And if you read some, some books like The Trail of Blood and other, and other things, you'll find out that these disciples went out and did what they knew they were to do. They, they re reached the world. I'm not saying that that's not for us to do that. We still need to go, and we're going to look at that later. But let's jump over to the book of Acts, Acts um, chapter 1. And I want to see the same command is going to be given here again. And you tell me who that's given to. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1 <clears throat> and verse 8. But, oh, let's see, i got to back up there. Well, verse 1, it says, This former treatise that I made unto Theopolis of all, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach unto the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandment unto them, unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Who is it again? Apostles. The apostles. These apostles, these are, these are the disciples, the apostles. And we jump down to verse 8. But ye shall receive power, and after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witness unto me both in Judea, Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the outermost parts of the earth. This was their commandment. Does that negate us of our responsibility? That is a big, fat no. Re Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Romans chapter 10. This is who we are. We're going to define that our, what is our responsibility? Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? <laughs> Wait a minute. Some of you, is there anybody in here that's never driven a stick shift in their life? So I get you I get you into a into a car that's got a stick shift and you go, oh I said just drive it. I just need you to drive it down the block. What's the problem? <laughs> you don't know. You don't even know what that pedal on the floor is for. Huh? What am I supposed to do with that thing? And the next thing you <clears throat> push the clutch in, you stick it in gear, you pop it. Oh now we're now it's dead. <laughs> Startled. Try again. Try again. And you, and you do everything. But you don't even know what it, you don't, you don't understand it. Next thing you're trying to stop it at the stoplight and you're holding down on the brake, that thing's dying. Why? You, well, you, you didn't understand it. How, do, how can we expect somebody to believe something they've never heard about? That's what the, Paul's saying here. He says, he said, how then shall they call on him? Who's him? They don't even know who it is they have, in whom they have not believed. And how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Uh-oh. Who's the preacher? That's all of us. We can preach. Preaching just means to proclaim the gospel. 
You say, but yeah, but I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a preacher. Well, your life preaches it. If you walk, you talk, you do whatever you do, and the places you go, it preaches. And when you sit down across the table from somebody, or you casually bump into them in a grocery store, you are preaching to them. You, and there's your opportunity to give them something that says, hey, what, what's inside of you? It's by hearing. Not just lifestyle. We need to get past just the lifestyle business. Life, a proper lifestyle and holiness before God is obviously a good thing to have. And it, it is required. We need to do those things. But what comes out of our mouth is also important. We, they need to hear from us. Hear from everyone. And how shall they preach? Now he's changing the subject. He said, how shall they preach except they be sent? Somebody's got to do the sending. Who's the sending? That's not necessarily my responsibility personally, but as a body of believers, that, that is our responsibility. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Somebody... Gets in a bad predicament. Been there, done that. Got, got stuck one day. My wife and I were out dating. Now she told me not to use her as an example, but she was just there. Yeah. We were out dating, and I, I said, well, let's go check something out. And I go down there. I had a two-wheel drive pickup. Back down to the driveway. It was too warm. I got stuck. I still, to this day, I don't know the, I don't know the man. Pulled up in a Jeep. Pulling a Ford, that, that was even, that's more sick than anything I know. But he helped pull me out. You know, I don't think he was that re refined, okay? But to me that day, he was beautiful to me. He pulled me out, got me out of a predicament. I was going to be late getting her home, except that he bailed me out. I remember the day that I was on my way to hell. And a lady gave her testimony. And I trusted Christ in my Savior. To me, she's a beautiful lady. When you bail somebody out of really tough times, when they know they're on their way, on a, on a destructive path, and you'll be beautiful. And he said, man, yeah, I, I, it's, it's not about the look. It's about what's inside. And it's because of the beautification of Jesus Christ. I want to go back to this. Um, we need to. Romans chapter 13. That's what we're trying to go to. Romans chapter 13, verse 9. I was looking at the wrong chapter. I was like, Where, what happened here? My notes. Romans chapter 13, verse 9. For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Oh, let's, let's go back to verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If you have a friend of yours or your neighbor, which is somebody close to you, and you know that they are on their way to hell, and you say nothing about them, do you love that neighbor or do you not? If your neighbor's house is on fire and you go, ah, well, I hope they got that thing under control and you drive down the road and you just keep on trucking and just like, all right, well, I, it's not my responsibility. Do you love that neighbor? I say no. You see a car crash and it's ugly and you're there, you're the first one, you're, you are the first responder. 
I, I don't like that saying, first responder. If you're a first responder, I'm sorry if that's offending you, but you're not the first responder most of the time. Most of the time it's a truck driver. Most of the time it's the first one there on the accident. That's a first responder. A lot of times first responders are usually 10th, 11th, 12th, whatever. First responders are the ones that get there first. What do you do? Do you drive on? In this day and age, everybody grabs their stupid phone and they, we're going to get a video and get it. I'm going to be hot on TikTok tonight. No, you're sick. Help. They're dying. They're hurting. Understand some very first things, like some first aid. How can you help? The, the, the thing's on fire, and they're trapped inside. Don't leave them sit. Don't leave them there. Try to put the fire out. Get them out. Do whatever you got to do. That's that's a first responder. You know somebody, and you have a friend that's that's doing very destructive things to their life, and you do nothing about it. But oh, well, hey, I, I'll tell you what. Well, let's make you an appointment with a pastor, and the next thing you go commit suicide, and it's all over. It's done, and that doesn't affect you. We have a problem. Love your neighbor as yourself. We're, we should do that. Those are the principles. That is our job. We should be doing that actively, being involved in miss, missions and ministry, telling our neighbor, you got a gift of eternal life. Don't you want your neighbor to have it? We should be doing that. So who's called to missions? Ryan? Becca, Henry, I can go down the list, everybody. We're all called to missions. It's not a, it's not a question if, if we're going to do it, if we're not going to do it. Verse 11, Romans chapter 13, verse 11, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. You know, what's, you know what our problem in this day and age? You know why we have a problem in Washington, D.C.? You know why we have a problem in Juneau? You know why we have a problem in, the, in Fairbanks? And you know why we have a problem? We have a problem because the church, and not just the church, but we have a problem with believers that are asleep at the wheel. We are asleep at the wheel. We're not doing the job. we got to wake up. The end is coming. I just had a birthday not long ago, man. I, I go, 55, what happened? Time's running out. What am I doing? Life is busy. Life is painful. Life is really frustrating. I don't know if you know this. Sometimes very, things are very frustrating. I worked, come over here and worked on that crazy heater last night. And I thought, man, I, I scheduled my day. I had this all figured out. I'm going to come spend one hour over here and fixing that crazy heater. What did I spend? About three hours? The first thing I did, very first thing I did, I said, I got all my tools together. I am all ready for this job. I get here. I needed a stubby screwdriver. You think I had it? I had, a whole, I had a whole toolbox. Oh, I finally found it when I was ready to put it back together again. I found the stubby screwdriver at <laughs> the bottom of that toolbox. Because I was so frustrated, I finally am dumping my toolbox out going, I don't know how to put this crazy thing back together again. One thing, it was just so frustrating. It's like everything I'm doing, I'm trying to take this thing apart. It hasn't been apart in a while. I finally get it yanked apart. And I got soot goes everywhere after my wife says, please don't get soot everywhere. And sure enough, my fingerprints are on the wall. I walked in here this morning and said, oh, I'm going to clean the wall off. Life's frustrating. Everything I seem to touch seems to take too long. I go to put the door on back there, and I said, man, I got the door all ready to go. I got that shelf all cut. It looks great. My wife's going, hey, yeah, you did a nice job, husband. And I get over here, and I go to put the door on. It doesn't fit right. I go to open it up, it bangs into the wall, and it can only open just far enough that I can barely squeeze through the door. I said, how did I mess it up? I even measured everything. I, I, I measured everything. No kidding. I measured everything with a tape measure and took pictures of all my measurements. There was no excuse. I couldn't get the door open. I said, I'm going to punch a hole through the wall because of this stupid door. So I get up there with my saw, and I just start hacking on it. 
It looked like I took an axe to it before it was done. My wife goes, it's all right. You're going to get it home. I said, I have to get this up for Sunday morning. I said, I have to go home. I have to cut this stupid shelf down smaller. I got it. And everybody's going, oh, it looks great. <laughs> no, it's an untrained eye looking at it. I run my hand over it. It feels like sandpaper on top. And I'm going, well, it's hanging up there. It's doing its job. It doesn't have to look pretty. It's just doing its job. Why? I just everything takes longer. It's frustrating. But you know what I can't do? I cannot skip my responsibility of making sure that when people come across my path, that they understand that Jesus Christ is a Savior. If we go back to Acts chapter 13, back to our text. I want you to see something. Acts chapter 13. Verse 1, it says, Now there was in the, in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas, Simon, that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, that guy Manan, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. He gives us a whole list of names. It's interesting. We'll get to that later. But what were these guys doing? He gave us a whole list of names. What are they doing? Verse 2, it says, And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have to do. For I have them to, that I've called them to do. Here's guys that were already out doing the work. Wouldn't it make sense to call somebody to do the job that's already doing the job? guy's already doing the job. Shouldn't he be the guy to go do the job? I'm wondering, what, I'm saying, well, what, what, what do you mean by that? I'll tell you what happens. Don't get offended. If you get offended, I'm sorry. Here's what, here's what typically happens in a, in a Baptist church. We have we have charismatic churches all around that have their own little charismatic movements and they got to speak in tongues, do whatever they got to do. It doesn't matter. And here's what happens in the Baptist church. We have a mission conference. And I'm not in that mission conference because I love mission conferences. But what do we do in a mission conference? We sit in the mission conference and get everybody all worked up and tend to get emotionally attached. And what happens in a missions conference is we're going, hey, God calling you? Is God calling you? Is God calling you? Is God calling you? Is God calling me? That's great. Number one, are you doing the work? Eric, thank you for working with Ram. Thanks for taking the guy, Glenn. You've been out on Ram, Henry, Ryan, all these Conleys. Go out and see the villages. Go out and preach, teach, do, do what you need to do. Thank you for working in the mission, Nick and, and uh, Derek. These are guys doing the work. They're getting out. They're doing it. And we say, well, who's, who's, can I, can I check on the Evans? I don't want to deal with it. And the Evans just says, hey, well, God's calling me to preach. Yep, Evan, when's the last time you preached? Don't know. And then what we have is we now have Evan saying, hey, man, I'm going to get involved in full-time ministry. You go, wait a minute, wait, wait. You, you haven't taught a Sunday school class. You haven't preached one time. And all of a sudden, God's calling you to preach? Maybe. Wouldn't it make more sense if the church got together and prayed and fasted and said, hey, the church has a burden to reach the lost. The church has a burden to reach the villages of Alaska. And we go and I, 
this is hypothetical, okay? Well, maybe, maybe, maybe Derek doesn't even want to do this. And we say, Derek, you're getting out of the, you're getting out of the Air Force in a year or whatever it is. I don't even know. Doesn't doesn't really matter. And we say, Derek, would you and your wife be interested in working the RAM ministry? Taking over the whole interior part? So Brother Pinnock doesn't have to come up out of out of Palmer. And we say, How I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. Since you're already doing it anyway, we know you're gonna get out of the out of the military. You're still gonna have bills. You still gotta you still gotta eat. You still gotta take care of your wife and and uh, maybe in a few years, maybe next year. We got a nut. We got got grandbaby on the way. Well, no, I'm, life happens. So he's still got to heat the house. He's still got to he's still got to eat, or at least his wife does. <laughs> Our joke around here for you new people is Derek doesn't like food. So <laughs> actually, he likes food. He just doesn't want to buy the food. So I'll just leave it right there. <laughs> Who's taking care of it? I'll tell you what happens. Evan comes along, as I keep picking on Evan just because I can. And Evan says, Hey, but I want to, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to a land I never heard of before. I have no idea about. I, I just, all of a sudden, I got this burden because somebody talked about it. Maybe I heard it, heard it on the radio. I heard about, hear about this, this place. Yes, they probably do need the gospel. And he says, Will you all send me? That's not how this was done in Acts. That's right. We're doing this backwards. Why? Why are we doing this backwards? Let's get on board. And take a guy that's saying, "Hey, man, Brother Ryan's getting out of the getting out of the military here shortly." Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Shame on the devil. <laughs> well, what are we doing as a church? Let me let me ask some questions. I've I've so far left my notes and and uh, I got too many pages anyway. I told my wife that last night I said I got six pages of notes. I said I, there's no way I'm going to get through it, so I'm just going to just going to go off off the rails here. You know we're getting beat. We as we as Baptists are being beat all over the world. in our failure to reach the world. What has happened? I'll tell you some things that have happened. We got this thing messed up. The church isn't fasting. The church isn't praying. And the church has not got a mind for the, for the world. We got a mind for what can we do in our house and what can we do. And I'm, I'm, I'm there myself. I've been there. But when is the last time that you personally called a missionary on the field? That's right. Yeah. When is the last time you personally said, hey man, I know your need. How can I fill it? And we wonder why these missionaries are going out there and they're going out to preach the gospel and they're there and they're alone. Oh, but wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll tell you what happened. Then they're done this, okay? Missionary on the field. And he's living in a goldfish bowl. I'm telling you what, I could not walk out of my house without hearing these words. Ah, Zungu! Means white man. And I'd sit there and I, I, I got to where it was a joke to me. I'd go, oh, look, yes, I still am white. <laughs> I thought I changed overnight. I, it was hilarious. But I could not go anywhere without a pile of people following the white man. Why? Because they're hoping that I'm going to drop them money like a, like a tree loses leaves. And then I say, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take one weekend. I said, we're just going to take off and we're going to go, we're going to go up to the lake about an hour's drive away. And you hide off at the lake and then you post pictures that you had a good time at the lake. And some G 
joker has the audacity to say, is that how you spend God's money? From the same people that will take a two-week vacation and go to Cancun or some other place, and they have no trouble because they earned their two-week vacation. How come, a, how come a missionary can't brag about, hey, man, we got away. We hid away. Hey, you understand as a missionary in a third world country that you live in a glass bubble 24-7? Your job doesn't go 9 to 5. Mine doesn't either. Mine is nine to five, six, whatever. Oh, and the phone rings at ten or text messages at midnight, and uh, my wife says, "Stop answering those things." I go, oh, "Whatever." <laughs> but I, I love my job. I, I got to do, I got to do my job. Missionaries that way. So many pounds on the gate. Now we got problems. We need some help. And then we criticize them for taking the. Vacation. What are we doing? Does that missionary not deserve it? You say, well, that's God's money. No, it's not. Do you understand that your personal paycheck is God's money as well? Yeah. What do you spend it on? Oh, don't meddle with my pocketbook. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Do you know the missionaries we support? Have you called them? Have you talked to them? Do you know what their needs are? Here, here's a better one. Do you know who their, who their kids' of names are? Do you know his wife's name? Mmm. I'm preaching it myself, too. Yeah. It's painful. Here's, here's a fun one. I, uh, I got vacation plans coming. Oh, well, good. Where are you going? You going to go see a missionary? No way. I am going to relax. You what? That's my time. Is it? If you're a born-again believer, I thought all of your time belonged to God. Awake! Awake! You sleepy Christian, wake up! What are you doing? There's some interesting verses I, I want to look at since I'm left all my notes behind here. John chapter 6, verse 60. John chapter 6, verse 60. The pastor talked about this verse here not long ago. Jesus had just got done talking to them about him being the bread of life and that they needed to eat him and drink his blood. And they, they didn't understand what he was talking about. And he basically was trying to say, hey, I am the way of life. Uh, it, it is me that you have to trust in. You need to, you, you need to be, your spirit needs to be so filled with me that that's where you get your satisfaction from. That's where you get your strength from. That's what he was trying to get them to understand. And they didn't understand it. And they looked at him in verse 60, John chapter 6 and verse 60. He said, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? I know some of the things I say today might, they might be hard. But we're being trashed by the world. Interesting to me that the Seventh-day Adventists, the, the Mormons, they have no trouble recruiting people. Why is that? I'll tell you why. Because over in Matthew, I better go find it here because I, since I left my notes so far behind, now I gotta go figure out where I'm at. I believe. find a reference later. If you need it, I'll tell you. But Jesus says these words. He says, the children of men are wiser than the children of light. Wow. 
Does that hurt? Man, that hurts. He was talking about an unjust steward that had made some choices, and he's like, man, I'm in, I'm in trouble. And he went out, and he said, hey, man, can you just can you pay part of this bill? Can you do this or that? He wanted some place to be able to go when he was, when he was fired. And Jesus said, There's, the world is smarter than you as believers. I'll tell you why. We have Evan. He says, he said, man, do you know what you're going to do when you grow up, Evan? Do you have a clue? But we keep saying, hey, Evan, I, I, I want you to sign up for full-time Christian service for the rest of your life. Isaiah? I know you're getting out of the army. You're not. You're not signing up again. I don't know why. But imagine a recruiter coming up to you a few years ago. I mean, you're not that old. Probably last year. <laughs> <laughs> that recruiter comes up to you and he says, "Hey, I want you to sign up for the army." I want you to sign up for the, your entire life. <laughs> Once you sign up, you can never get out. If you get out, everybody else in the United States is going to look at you and say, man, you are a failure. Does that happen? Why? Why would he be a failure? No, we, we reward him and we say, hey, you're, you're the best man. Thanks for the honor. Thanks for putting in your four years of your life. Invested it. Why is it when we get a missionary that says, hey, man, I'll go. I don't know about doing it for my whole life. I said, can you just go for two years? Can you go for a year? Can you just go for six months? I think Pastor said it about, I think it was last Sunday, last, last week's Sunday school class. And he said, he said, I want all my kids to, to go to a Bible college or do something, uh, an institute or something for one year. Maybe I got that a little wrong, uh, but I, I had done the same thing. I told my kids, I said, I, I, I would want you to go to Bible school or I want you to go to the mission field for one year. Matter of fact, when I made that, when I made that statement, I told my kids, I said, I'll support you. I will send you for one year if you'll go to the mission field or you'll go to Bible school. Lord knows I sent my first kid off. I dropped him off at in uh, a Bible college that I would not recommend anybody to go to at this point. Melissa, <laughs> she wouldn't have recommended me drop him off then either. I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't know. I checked it out a little bit. I thought I knew some people there, and, and uh, so I dropped my boy off. And less than a year later, I took the rest of my family on that missions trip. It was supposed to be for, for permanent. We, we moved. We took everything with us. That uh, We took all our, what was left of our worldly possessions, and we moved it, and we went to Africa. I would not trade those three and a half years that I spent in Malawi, Africa. My kids got an education. My kids got a chance to get some grounding in the Word of God. I wouldn't say that my kids were a failure because they, you know, well, you didn't stick stick it out. Some of my kids came home earlier. But three and a half years, let me ask you this. Would you, would you believe me if I told you that not one time, not one time, did my church call me and ask me how things were going? Not one time. 
did my church find out from me personally how I was doing without me calling and being set to harm them. You know how many missionaries, you, you go to churches and you look down their missions and they call their hall of fame and they've got their missionary wall, all these missionaries up and down the hall. And you go there and you go, wow, check out all these missionaries. What are they doing? And then you go to find people and they go, hey, well, I've been over there. I've I visited that missionary, and you know what he's doing? That, that one right there. He's, uh, he's building a kingdom. You know why? Because we have churches not checking up on those missionaries. They're spending their time doing what they're going to do. And they, instead of working themselves out of a job, they go, I don't want to start over again. You know why they don't want to start over again? Because they don't have any support back home. Because they didn't have a Derek to show up and check on them, see how they were doing. Mm -hmm. Didn't have a Ryan to call them up. Hey, hey, man, how how things going? We have a missionary in St. Mary's that we need to contact with them regularly. If we're going to support them, we need to communicate with them. You know the word communicate does not just mean, and we've heard that in missions conferences all the time, it means to do what? Communicate meaning in, in a missions conference means what? Give money. No, communication is more than that. It means sharing. That means I say, Brian, I know you've got a need, man. Your car's broke. I got one. I got your credit. You know what I just communicated with him? He matters. Got a missionary we're trying to communicate with, this one in St. Mary's. We're trying to figure out how that we can be a part of helping them get out of the church building and into, into a house building. Yeah, if it doesn't catch on fire. Yeah, catch on fire. Right. There's a group going out next month and going to try to help him get some things squared away and uh, doing some groundwork to help us get some eyes on what's happening and how we can make this building project work. Why? Because we're communicating with him. We're trying to lift his needs, bear his burden. Are we burden bearers? Or are we just excited about what we can put down a missions hall of fame wall? Man, we support 50 missionaries. They all get, they all get 100 bucks a month or 50 bucks a month. We want to find some missionaries. We want to support missions. But what are we doing about missions? How do we fix this problem? I'll tell you what we need to do. I'll go back on my notes. We need to fix this problem by not repeating the same problem. We need to communicate with these missionaries. We need to support them. How do we support them? By communicating. We talk to them. Man, you have a problem. Let me, how, how do I pray for it? How do, how do I fix this? What, what am I going to do about it? We plan to check on them. Encourage them. You know, if I had a business, which I don't, I, I, I'd rather work for somebody else. I don't want that responsibility. It's a liability. It's a liability to pay them. Well, if he goes out there with that grater and he knocks off 50 mailboxes one day, they're just canned him, but somebody's got to be able to can these mailboxes up. But if we have a missionary, we have a, we have a liability. We have a responsibility. Check on them. And if they come off the field, they come off the field early because they got discouraged because, because of the, the failure of whatever, that is our fault and not theirs. We need to do something about it. And most of it is because we didn't encourage them, we didn't lift their burden, we didn't pray for them, we don't even know their names.
chances are their name didn't even cross our mind in the past year, past month, past week. If I stepped on your toes, I meant to. Do we know their needs? Are we as a church doing missions work? You know, some of these things we've got covered a little bit. We're doing some of those things, but we as a church. Are we praying and fasting for it? When was the last time you prayed and fasted for the rest of your church? Ouch. Yes, my back hurts. So do my toes right now, too. Are we praying and fasting? Are we as a church actively looking for to send a full-time person into the work? And if we do, are we willing to finance them as a full-time missionary? I know very, very few churches that have taken somebody off of their pew and have sent them as their missionary. Mm -hmm. I mean, where they didn't go spend three years out looking to raise support so they could go. Maybe we as a small church say, man, we're too small. We can't do this. You know, there's a principle in the Bible on that. Remember at the Passover and, and uh, they're getting ready to leave Egypt and, and Moses comes to them and says, hey, I want you to go kill the Passover lamb. He said, but what you're going to do is you're going to take the blood, you're going to put it on the doorpost and uh, the death angel's going to pass over. He's going to pass over and save your firstborn son. He said, then what are you supposed to do with the rest of the lamb? You're supposed to take it, you roast it with fire. And he said, and you're supposed to eat it. Eat it all, all of it. Oh, oh well. Well, Nick and Emily can handle it because Nick will eat it all. <laughs> well, what if your family's too small and you can't do it? He says, that's fine. Your family's too small. Gather, gather up some other people and say, hey, man, come to my house. We'll, we'll kill the fats over here and we're, we're, we're going to eat the Passover, but we're, we have to eat the whole thing tonight. There's a principle in that. And we say, hey, our church is too small. And we say, hey, we got, well, there's another like-minded church down the road. And we say, hey, man, I've got, I've got this missionary. I, does this sound backwards from the way things are done today? And we as a church, say, we reach out to another church and we say, hey, we got this guy that's actively involved in missions, but we can't handle the whole thing by ourselves. Would you help us to send him? That's not how things are done. What we do is we've, we've made beggars out of missionaries to go run around to churches and beg around for money. The church isn't doing it. Why? That's what got me so excited about this whole building project for, for Brother Warren out there in St. Mary's. And I said, I, said I, I, I don't even know how that all came about. I said, why, why should this guy go out and have to raise money to, to build a house? Why can't we together get together and, and put something together? And he's got, a, he's got a sphere of influence. you got a sphere of influence. Brother Steve's got a sphere of influence. And we could, no problem, send it out on Facebook and say, hey, man, here's, here's the project. Here's a, here's a guy that's doing the job. Let's get this out here, and we can raise the money and he doesn't have to take a year off of his life to go raise the money to do the job. If we, off the top of our head, we're, we're probably at about $350,000 what we're looking for to build a house in the village. That's unheard of. Absolutely unheard of. That means to get the materials together, all loaded up, set on a barge, a dollar a pound down the river and be there in the village for $350,000. You go, man, that is huge. How many churches would it take to raise $2,000 a piece to get that guy a house? Cut it in half. What if we did $5,000? Maybe some individuals get together. We suddenly take this thing that's so astronomical, and we, we've all heard the dumb thing that says, how do you need a, eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You don't eat the whole thing. You don't swallow the whole thing. You eat him one bite at a time. I'm surprised how fast a, a moose can disappear when, you know, everybody, man, that's a lot of meat. No, it's not. One bite at a, one meal at a time, man, and it, 
all shows. So there we go. It disappears one bite at a time. We can do this. We just got to get together and do it. There is nothing, nothing too hard for our Lord. Are we ready to do it? Are we ready to take on this work and do it different? We got to stop being failures and quit letting the world run over us. And we got to get behind and get people excited about going on missions. Are we ready for Isaiah saying, hey man, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to sign up for the army. I'm done. Maybe we look at Isaiah and we say, you know, there's a, there's a project that's getting started and this missionary is working on this. Would you take a year of your time if we, if we support you and you, we, we help you? Maybe you go out there to St. Mary's and help Brother Warren and up and down the river and would you just take one year? Man, that's one bite at a time. And he goes out there and after one year he says, man, I'm having such a good time. He says, you think I can do another year? Sure. And he's reaching five, I think, I think Israel Warren's reaching five, five different villages out of, out, of, out of St. Mary's. He can't do it by himself. Who's willing to go? And is our church willing to send somebody? Are we willing to do it? Or do we want to just keep playing games? I'll tell you where we need to start. Number one, you must be born again. Maybe you're sitting here today. And you say, man, I don't even know who this Jesus is you're talking about. He's the one that died for your sins. There's none righteous, no, not one. We need to, we got to start there. We got to start in our own house. Are we about our father's business? If you're not about the father's business, your priorities are messed up. And in Matthew chapter 9, verse 38, Jesus told us and he commanded us that we should pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labor into his field. It's his field. Are we, are we praying to send forth laborers? Off of our pews, out of our home, our own children. And at my age, eventually my own grandchildren. Are we praying for that actively or are we just thinking about it? Oh, that's a great idea. Are we going to walk out of here? Saying, wow, that was a nice message. That's different. That was a good rant. Or are we going to repent? And are we going to correct our ways? We're making a lot of mistakes as a church, not necessarily this church I'm talking about, church today. Let's do it right. Maybe God's working in your heart, your life, and you say, man, I never thought about missions this way. I never thought about... I remember, I remember a guy in Malawi, Africa. I got this bright idea. I'd taken my four-wheeler over there. and I had this bright idea. I said, I just want to go over the mountain. And the uh, guy I was working with, he said, he said, I'll go with you. We'll go get hand out a gospel, pile of gospel tracks. I think it, I don't know. I had, a, I had several thousand tracks. And we uh, just wanted to get over the mountain. Miserable hot day, didn't take enough water. I thought I was going to die of thirst. My youngest boy, he and I, and, and, the, and this missionary, a uh, friend of mine, um, local, uh, he, he went with me. And we're just handing out gospel tracks. Most of these people never seen a four-wheeler in their life. 
So I got kids chasing after me, and like a 50 to 100 kids chasing after me till I wear them out, and then they finally go home, and they, they new recruits come, and they just uh, everybody chases them, and everybody wants to talk to me for help. I saw this one guy, and I just happened to get up to him, and I handed him a track, and then we got on the other side of the mountain, and finally I made it back over, and I seen this. It was getting getting on toward dark, and here's this. Here's this black guy in the middle of Africa, and it's getting close to dark. It's not a good thing when they come running up to you. You have no idea what they're going to do. And he comes running up to me, just waving his hands. I'm like, oh, man, I don't know what I did to him, make him mad. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I ran through his field. I don't, I don't know what happened. And he stops me, and he just starts talking excitedly, and I couldn't keep up with his. I, I knew a little bit of language, not much, and he's just talking and talking and carrying on. And finally... I see tears running down his face. And uh, I said, I said, Abusa, which is the preacher, I said, what, what, what's he saying? And he says, well, he says, that man just telling you thank you for giving him a gospel track. He said, he was in his 30s. He said, I'm 30 some years old. And he said, I never once thought about dying. said, now I know where I'll spend eternity. Maybe you're here today and you never once thought about eternity and whether you're going to die. Life is short. Life is coming to an end. We're not guaranteed of tomorrow. Where will you spend eternity? Next question is, where will your neighbor spend eternity? Have you thought about his eternity? And are you reaching him? Look at this. Mary and Tom. Let's going to give an opportunity for you to come. Maybe you want to pray.